Hello and welcome to yet another exciting episode of iBuzz. I'm your host, Nasheen Bukhari, bringing you the latest and most exciting news from showbiz world. In today's episode, we will discuss the Cannes Film Festival, followed by a movie review on the hippopotamus. First things first, let me quickly take you to the top stories of the day. Veteran actor Dilip Kumar dies at the age of 98. Britney Spears' manager resigns and claims the singer intends to officially retire. Cannes Film Festival opens with all glory and COVID violations. Cannes director slams Netflix for allowing movies in too easily. Kim Kardashian announces to shut down her KKW beauty line. And now moving to the top story of the day. The head of Cannes Film Festival takes a swipe at other film festivals saying they were too quick to allow movies made by streaming giants without strict rules, harming cinema as a result. To have further discussion on the subject, we are joined by entertainment journalist Liam Heffernan. To have further discussion on the subject, we are joined by the entertainment journalist Liam Heffernan. Liam, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you. So, uh, the head of the Cannes Film Festival took a swipe at rival events. In your opinion, is his statement justified? Uh, absolutely not. No, I think that. Uh, uh, this is something that's been a, a, a discussion uh, it's cropped up quite a lot over the last couple of years um, you, you, particularly you know it started with films like Roma which were you know uh, very very targeted at the awards uh, market from Netflix and their way of kind of breaking into that and before then uh, it wasn't really very common for streaming services to to have a, a very successful um, um, contender in award season uh, Roma really changed that and uh, last year, of course, with the pandemic, uh, it was all about streaming services. And, you know, I think that people like uh, Thierry from O need to recognize that the industry is changing. The, the, the way that people are watching films or enjoying films is, is changing uh, almost uh, irreversibly. Mm -hmm. And I think that the cinema experience mm -hmm. is, is going to be vastly different in a couple of years from what it was uh, even five, ten years ago, and it, it just—it feels like that it's no coincidence that mm -hmm. the people that are most vocal against the rise of streaming services are these kind of wealthy white men who mm -hmm. who feel threatened by platforms which break down the kind of historical barriers to entry. Um, I, I really don't see what the issue is. Right, and it is obvious that cinemas were closed due to COVID restrictions, and hence. There was no other choice but to stream movies through these platforms like Netflix and Amazon Prime. Uh, but the, the festival director says that these platforms ha have actually harmed the cinema. So in what ways you can say that this harm has been, you know, occurred to, to the cinemas? So, I, you know, I think there's, there's an argument there that streaming services uh, kind of blur the line between film and, mm -hmm. and TV a little bit more. Um, perhaps uh, you know, quality and kind of high-end mm -hmm. cinema gets a bit watered down for more, you know, entertainment, uh, binge-worthy kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in that respect, I, I get it. Um, but I do think that, that when you look at Netflix and you look at Amazon and you look at Disney+, Plus, mm -hmm. you know, they do pander to mass audiences because, of course, they need the subscriptions. But I also think that there's a real concerted effort to deliver some some genuinely high-end quality mm. cinema. Um, so, I think it's just the way that we're watching it is changing. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And Liam, unlike Cannes, some other film festivals, including Venice, have included films made by streaming giants in their uh, main competition lineups without imposing such stringent demands. Do you think that? This was an effort that has to be appreciated in order to keep the movie industry industry going on without remaining stagnant. Yeah, you know, I, I just think the industry as a whole is 
is changing, it's adapting, and the last year has 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 been a, a massive shock to the system, and it's it's really uh, it's really challenged the, the status quo, and. I think we're going to come out of this with a much more robust and, and a much healthier film industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do think it's a shame that that um, people like um, for a moment, uh, you know, festivals like like Cannes are a bit slower mm-hmm. in embracing that because I think it's the future. Um, but you know, I, I do think that we're going to come out of this for the better. I, I think. The, you know, the films that are being produced and particularly the diversity mm-hmm. and the breadth of films that are being produced, you know, uh, in, you know, the people behind the camera exactly. uh, as well as in front of it is, is a huge positive and streaming services are the ones championing that. You know, mm-hmm. I, th- I think that these kind of historical festivals and, and, um, uh, uh, and producers need to, to maybe learn a lesson or two from them um, mm-hmm. so that we can have a fully diverse and inclusive industry. Right. Uh, the director of Fromage said Netflix had been invited to this year's festival to screen films out of the competition, but had declined. Do you think that the sc- streaming company's protest against the rule is justified? Um, I, yeah, I, I, I guess so. You know, it's kind of like being invited to a, to a party and, and mm-hmm. being um, told to just sit at the kids' table <laughs> all day. You know, I, I, I get why Netflix are kind of digging their heels in with this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what, why, why turn up if you're not allowed to compete? Right. Uh, Amazon seems to be pretty much flexible with the rules, though. They have included two of their films in, in, in the festival. So it seems like, you know, they're trying to make it up with the uh, Cannes Film Festival director. Yeah, they're obviously, you know, extending an olive branch and, and, and trying to, to still uh, maintain some sort of relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think this will all blow over in a couple of years. I think they'll find a happy medium. But um, yeah, it, it's just I think from Netflix's point of view, they need to to ride it out and not not ruffle too many feathers in the meantime. Right. And Liam, uh, films included from streaming platforms are not eligible for the competitions. Rather, they were only screened for the audiences. Whereas a lot of masterpieces were created and released on Netflix and Amazon Prime, which deserve not only to be in the competition but they deserve to win as well what is your take on that well yeah you know as i mentioned a couple of minutes ago you know i think mm-hmm. that the streaming services are creating much better quality films and and, and they're creating them with a view to, to um, sending them to to award mm-hmm. season and you know it's a very different type of film you know it's 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 what's called prestige mm-hmm. pictures it's not the ones that necessarily want a, a mass audience of millions of people watching um they're, they're designed to um give a bit more creative autonomy to the filmmakers mm-hmm. um, they're designed to be a bit higher end a bit more um, um artistic um, shall we say um streaming services are doing that and they deserve to be recognized they deserve mm-hmm. to compete Right. And Liam, in what ways do you think that the filmmakers will be directly affected by this rule, especially those of the indie filmmakers who made it to Netflix and Amazon Prime? Yeah, obviously it's going to be, um, it's going to have an impact on, on them, you know, but I think we, um, you know, we, we should at least recognize the fact that um, mm-hmm. they're even part of the conversation now. You know, just a few years ago, you know, when streaming services weren't, didn't have the, the sort of footprint they had in the industry, independent filmmakers um, and people from you know minority backgrounds um, weren't even on the radar um, but now you know the, the the slate of films that are being made is so much more diverse and 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 at least we we've kind of addressed the first issue in giving opportunities mm-hmm. to people who didn't have opportunities before um, we're still in this kind of second phase which is actually getting them the recognition they deserve as well right and uh, Liam, do you think that uh, Cannes Film Festival is now going to lose its credibility? Because people, most of the people are, you know, much more familiar with Netflix rather than what happens at Cannes. Not everybody attends that. So do you think that with this sort of, of uh, rule and, um, I mean, restriction, you think that Cannes can lose its credibility and people are, you know, going to turn towards Netflix more? Um, I, I'm not sure. I think I think people that that pay attention to Cannes, uh, people uh, that, that go to the festival, um, uh, are probably likely to agree with Cannes' take because I think there is quite a disparity, you know, between the, the people who who stream stuff on Netflix and the people who who buy something because it's it it, mm. it was acclaimed a cat, 
you know, you, you've got two very different ends of the market there. Um, so I think it's probably quite on brand at the moment for Cam to be taking this stance, mm -hmm. um, but, but it, it will change. Right. And Liam, do you think that there should be a win-win situation where the CAMS organizers and streaming platform CEOs come up with a collective solution because the amount of viewership uh, of certain movies, it is, I mean, it's gained online. Sorry, let me, let me rephrase this question. So, Liam, do you think that there should be a win-win situation where the CAMS organizers and streaming platform CEOs come up with a collective solution because the amount of viewership certain movies gained online is even at times more than received by the movies released in theaters? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think what, I, I think the conversations are already happening. So, mm -hmm. so yes, is the short answer. Uh, but I think there's, there's a gray area, you know, how much do you want to base eligibility and, and awards on popularity? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at what point do you, do you take that into consideration? Um, over artistic merit, um, mm -hmm. if at all, you know. So it, it's a really fine line to balance in terms of recognizing films that that kind of do their job as a mass medium and entertain mm -hmm. the masses, um, but also have a lot of artistic merit, which which might mean um, it doesn't quite get the audience it should. Right. And there was a plot twist in the story when the CEO of Netflix said that pulling out their movies from the Cannes Film Festival was a way too far that their uh, organization has gone. So do you think that they also have realized that this rule has a kind of impact in the movie world? Either they have to abide by the Cannes uh, Film Festival rules or they can, you know, survive on their own. So what do you, what do you think of this statement? Yeah, you know, I, I think that, that people make this kind of stance um, because they feel they they should there's almost mm -hmm. this um this this value driven um kind of old-fashioned uh, mm -hmm. opinion this is the way it should be so this is the way it needs to be and and mm -hmm. you know you could even look at spielberg a couple of years ago come out in this massive kind of anti-netflix anti-streaming service um uh, ran uh, aimed at netflix mm -hmm. uh, and uh, has subsequently done a u-turn uh, so i i think people who who stand by this argument mm -hmm. probably believe it but they don't really know why Right, right. Liam, great discussion. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you very much. That was Liam Heffernan. And now moving to other story details of the day. Legendary Bollywood actor Dilip Kumar, one of the biggest stars in the golden age of Indian cinema from the 1940s to 1960s, passed away on Wednesday at the age of 98. Nicknamed the Tragedy King because of his brooding good looks and deep voice, Kumar played the lead in some of the Indian film industry's most commercially successful films of the period, earning him iconic status. Britney Spears' longtime manager Larry Rudolph has resigned, citing the singer's intention to officially retire as his reason of stepping down. Rudolph announced his departure from the post in a letter written to Britney's father, Jamie Spears, and attorney Jody Montgomery. In the letter, Rudolph said that while he has been working as Britney's manager for much of her 25 years career, he hasn't communicated with her in the last two years. He has also stated that he has never been a part of the controversy surrounding the singer's conservatorship, which Britney is requesting to be removed after it was put in place in 2008 following her public breakdown. The Cannes Film Festival opened Tuesday and quickly rediscovered its heady mix of glamour, politics and controversy. The stars seemed unable to keep up with the social distancing rule. Hollywood star Jodie Foster summed up the mood of a pandemic hit planet as she received an honorary Palm d'Or for her stellar career from Spanish director Pedro Almodovar. Reality TV star Kim Kardashian has decided to temporarily shutting down her KKW beauty line with an aim to give the brand a modern, innovative makeover. Taking to Twitter on Tuesday, the 40 years old star announced that she would be temporarily closing down her lucrative KKW beauty line to rebrand. The KKW beauty website will go dark on August 1st and return under a completely new brand with new formulas. There are reports and speculations that Kim was revamping due to her divorce from Kanye West and will be dropping the letter W from the brand name, which of course is not a surprise. 
And that is it from our newsroom. We will be right back after a quick short break with a review on the movie The Hippopotamus. Stay tuned. Welcome back. In this segment, we will review the 2017 comedy movie, The Hippopotamus. In need of money to fund his partying life, a once esteemed poet takes a lucrative job investigating the alleged miracles that occur at a country estate. To review the movie, we are joined by film critic Homey Wasim. Homey, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Nasheen. So, Homey, the movie seems to be a whole lot of a roller coaster ride with too many surprises lying at the end. It's a real treat for subtle comedy lovers. What is your take on that? So, I found the movie to be really fun and mm -hmm. it was a light-hearted comedy, um, mm -hmm. but also it had a strong and poignant message at the end. Mm -hmm. um, as you said, you know, the main character played by Roger Allen, yes. Ted Wallace. It's based on a novel written by Stephen Fry back in 1994. Mm -hmm. Now, Stephen Fry is a famous comedian and also yes. known for being a very hardcore atheist and a rationalist. Mm -hmm. So the movie has those themes of, you know, spirituality versus rationality, which I personally found to be very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, his own personality, you know, having these caustic one-liners and the way he mm -hmm. would insult people using these really long words and like very um, mm -hmm. extensive vocabulary. I found that to be very, very interesting mm -hmm. being a writer myself. Mm -hmm. So I think it was a fun watch. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Right. And Ted's character is something you cannot figure out very easily that what exactly to consider him a protagonist, anti-hero, whatnot. Um, what were your initial thoughts on his character while watching the movie? Uh, yeah, I mean, most comedies, especially British comedies, they have the protagonist to be a very grey character, not a very mm -hmm. black and white character. Yeah. So I would say that he was somewhat of an anti-hero. Mm -hmm. And um, because he used to be very, very famous like three decades ago as a poet, mm -hmm. and now he had just been fired from his job. So you could really see the melancholy and the nihilism yes. in his attitude throughout the film. And mm -hmm. it was fun, but at times it also became rather depressing, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, but overall, I think the message was something that you could learn from. Mm -hmm. Right, and the funny one-liners in the movie were absolutely entertaining. Also, everybody in this movie being so articulate. I mean, you actually experience yourself, you know, surrounded by some royals, British royals. This is what defers it from other modern-day comedy movies. Yeah, definitely. Um, if you're a writer or a poet, mm -hmm. then this would definitely add to your vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, there are many new words that I have certainly <laughs> learned. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, also, Homey, some some sorry, some some critics claimed that a few moments of clever script writing and some ex excellent acting performances dotted about in a largely self-indulgent yet poorly designed storyline. What is your take on that? Yeah, it's something that I noticed as well. Like the movie was very promising in the beginning, but mm -hmm. through the middle, it became a bit of a drab. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is because it was adapted from a novel and um, in a novel, things unfold very mm -hmm. gradually, very slowly. Mm -hmm. But when you're going to put that on the big screen, then things have to happen very, very mm -hmm. quickly in a very snappy manner. Mm -hmm. So yes, it did become a bit of a drab. And mm -hmm. yes, um, you could see a lot of Stephen Fry's own personality in this character, in his own worldview. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people might not be able to relate to that. Mm -hmm. Homey, what is your take on the supporting cast in the movie, especially about the characters of Fiona Shaw and Emily Barrington? Um, I think they did a good performance. Mm -hmm. um, their role wasn't that significant in the movie. Um, mm -hmm. We see just small glimpses of them but mm -hmm. whatever performance whatever screen time that they did take i think it was a good job mm -hmm. particularly i like the performance of david who plays the young poet the teenage poet boy mm -hmm. um it was played by tommy knight and i think yes. he is performance is very realistic so mm -hmm. i particularly enjoyed that right and the last five minutes were so intense of course without giving any spoilers here 
We can talk about how the story takes a very quick twist in the end. Uh, yeah, it does take this twist. And I think it's um, especially useful for people who tend to have very phantasmal thinking where they believe that, you know, everything that's happening around them mm -hmm. is due to some, you know, really spiritual phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, it teaches us, us something about empiricism mm -hmm. and rationality. And I think a society like ours could benefit from it, where people do tend to mm -hmm. have this um, phantasmagoric thinking mm -hmm. and they tend to correlate to unrelated phenomena together. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's good, but at the same time, it might offend spiritual people or religious people. Mm -hmm. um, but I would suggest them to not take it personally. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, they say it takes all kinds of people to make the world go round. Mm -hmm. So people who do tend to over-spiritualize can learn a thing mm -hmm. or two from people who tend to be very, very rational, like right. the character of um, Right. And Hume, the transitioning uh, in this movie is something which is remarkable. I mean, we, we have seen movies previously from go going from comedy to tragedy, but, but they are halfway through and you were able to find out that what's going to happen. However, the transitioning in this movie is something that keeps you on toes and, you know, keeps on, um, keeps on making you think that what will be happening in the end. So what is your take on that? um yeah like personally i didn't think it was such a like on the edge of your seat mm -hmm. kind of a movie uh -huh. um because in the middle i think it became a bit of a drab mm -hmm. but at the end i think that's where most of the action happens mm -hmm. um so yeah that was good it was um like at the beginning you're just thinking like what is this movie about what is the mm -hmm. point of this movie what's the point but by the end we get to see okay this is what it's about mm -hmm. and um it's like i said very much reminiscent of stephen fry himself mm -hmm. i would also say that it's very reminiscent of christopher hitchens mm -hmm. who is a famous atheist and was a good friend of stephen fry's mm -hmm. so ted wallace's character really reminded me of hitchens i would say that he even looked like mm -hmm. um also homey this movie had a lot of characters in it i mean there were too many people in the casting so do you think that that was unnecessary because it was just a comedy movie about one person but there uh, there seemed to be a lot of casting in the movie so uh, what do you think of that um yeah i would say that there were a few too many characters and they weren't as well developed or they didn't have as distinct personalities mm -hmm. as, the, as the main character mm -hmm. i think that their dialogues were also not um, as well developed or mm -hmm. as you know sarcastic and funny as this main characters mm -hmm. um but the cast was well thought of at the same time mm -hmm. um and i think most of them did a good job uh -huh. and do you think that there was a connection missing uh between the rest of the cast and the main character uh yes to an extent mm -hmm. uh, there was um we could i think the the producers and the directors could have really milked on that mm -hmm. and given us you know more interesting scenarios and dialogue exchanges between Ted Wallace mm -hmm. and the rest of the cast right and about the production the way the movie was produced the, may, the, the way it was shot uh, especially the shots that were taken outdoors th those were amazing showing the country life of, of England so uh, what are your thoughts on that Yes, absolutely. That's one of the things that I really enjoyed about mm -hmm. this film. Um, I think it was visually really, really stunning, mm -hmm. um, especially the shots that are in the countryside with, mm -hmm. you know, lots of greenery, and, you know, a pond and ducklings mm -hmm. and, you know, this huge, great mansion. Mm -hmm. So that was definitely a pleasure to watch, especially mm -hmm. during times of lockdown. Right. And other than movie being dragged, like you said that you disagree uh, with the fact that the movie was very engaging. So other than that, what other points do you think that the movie could have done better at? Um, okay, without giving away too many spoilers, I would mm -hmm. say that the central theme of the movie, which was to show that, okay, um, you know, rationality is more mm -hmm. superior to spirituality. 
I thought that was a little bit too biased um, mm-hmm. because personally I do believe um, that there is spiritual phenomenon mm-hmm. um, which we cannot see but of course we can feel mm-hmm. and secondly I think um, the character of Robert Wallace would mm-hmm. have been funnier and wittier um, mm-hmm. like he was shown to be I think he was shown to be more interesting than he, than he actually mm-hmm. was right right and um how would you rate the movie on a scale of 1 to 10 and why um so between a 6 and a 7 so probably a 6 and a half uh-huh. um i i did enjoy watching the film mm-hmm. and i did learn certain things from it mm-hmm. but like i said the, the character could have been have a more well-rounded personality mm-hmm. um I think his pompousness was a little bit annoying for mm-hmm. me personally. Um so if he were more down to earth and mm-hmm. maybe a little bit more open minded towards spiritual mm-hmm. phenomenon. Right. Um especially respecting religions of the past. Mm-hmm. I think that would have been more satisfying to me personally mm-hmm. as a viewer. Right. Home a great discussion. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you so much for having me. That was Homey Vasim reviewing the movie The Hippopotamus. And that is it from today's episode. We hope you liked it. Don't forget to share your feedback on the social media link mentioned down below. We'll see you next time. Until then, take care and goodbye.